Bom dia, Secretary of State, Mayor, everybody in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, children. It's really great to be here today. I live in Switzerland, which is also a country that's kind of small, but prouds itself of tourism. I do a lot of work on the future globally, and in the last few years, tourism and travel has become a big priority for me. I want to start by talking about the bomb futuro, the good future. Uh, this is a theme I've worked on for the last three years, and it's been accelerated because of COVID. When I speak about the good future, a lot of people are saying, you must be joking, right? There is no good future. I speak to my own children, 28 and 33, and they're saying there is no good future because we have killed the good future by what we do. That's their argument. And everything around us is not so good. For example, you can clearly see when we talk about the future, uh, as we understand it, the future comes first in our imagination, then in our will, and then in reality. There is no future that just pops up, right? First we imagine it, then we make it, and then it exists. And this is why we're here. Very important to remember this as we go through this event. Uh, also, when we think about the future, we get all these images, right? Of, uh, yeah, climate problems, droughts, hurricanes, war, uh, artificial intelligence, all of the movies we see this day on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or what RTP, whatever you're watching, right? The future looks dark. Well, I'm here to tell you the future is better than we think. Not just for tourism, right? but generally speaking. Because one thing that's happening that we keep forgetting is all of the major improvements that we have undergone in the last two decades not just in technology, but also in humanity. I'll give you some examples on this, but really important to understand if we want a good future, we have to start with how we think about it. Your mindset makes your future. You think badly about the future, it's like thinking badly about your wife or your husband. Right? You can go to therapy and try to fix the problem, but you have to change the way that you think about things. right? Our thinking shapes our reality. And of course, we're not in charge of everything. We're not in charge of Russia. We're not in charge of energy. You know, it's not one person that can change everything. But very important to see that the future is defined by the choices we make. I'm very happy to hear in the earlier talks the choices that Portugal and this, this city and Machizinhos in particular has already made. And I have to tell you, I'm super impressed with Portugal as to a lot of the choices that Portugal has made in the last few years. It's one of the leading countries in the world as far as the future is concerned, in my view. So I'll give you some examples of where this is going. I'll start with my film, The Good Future. And here, by the way, if you have your mobile phone, you can scan the code. That's where the film is, The Good Future, with Portuguese subtitles. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't speak Portuguese well enough, but if you just scan the code, you will get to the website where the it's a YouTube link. Uh, I'll show it again later, but you'll see it there. So most importantly about this is we have three revolutions that we're undergoing today, right at this very moment. I, th I find this super exciting and sometimes a little bit worrisome. Right? Because the technology revolution, for example, is everywhere. But we all know that technology can be used for many good things and for many bad things. Look at social media, right? We thought social media was going to be the answer for lots of problems in media. Turns out, not true, right? Social media has good pieces, but it causes manipulation, distorts thinking, has fake news, right? puts money over people. So too much technology can also be a bad thing. Right? Generally, you can say too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. Smoking, drinking, alcohol, coffee, cigarettes, food, right? You can die by eating too much. Obesity. 400 million people. Right? More people die from obesity 
than from hunger. Right? And you can die from too much technology. So we have to create a balance. This is very important because in the end, technology is not a religion. And even if it was, you know, it's much more important to think about what we need. So here are the three revolutions. The first one, of course, the digital revolution. That kind of goes without saying, right? The second one is much bigger, the sustainability revolution. The third one is the purpose revolution. Well, purpose is the age-old human question, right? What are we here for? What do we want? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Right? The human revolution, you could say. So we're going to share the slides later. You can keep taking pictures if you want, but we'll send the PDF around later. <laughs> It'll be a lot easier. So the digital revolution is kind of an old hat, right? In many ways, this, we're doing this every day now. And everything we see here is digital revolution. So that's ongoing, and it's really important. But the sustainability revolution is a hundred-year-old tradition of the fossil fuel industry shifting to green. A hundred fifty trillion euro shift. Right? I mean, this is happening right now at this very moment. Once the war in Ukraine, Russia subsides or is being resolved sometime this year, I hope, we're going to see a huge amount of activities on the sustainability revolution. At the same time, we have the discussion of the purpose. What is the purpose of the stock market? For example, so far, obviously, profit, growth, jobs. But this isn't working anymore. We need a larger story. If we just pursue profit, we're going to time out roughly in 20 or 30 years. If all we want is profit, we will never address climate change. That's quite obvious. This is the problem we're having today. So as we're moving into this, uh, just to zoom in a little bit on this, on the digital revolution, we have, of course, uh, the, what are called the game changers, right? 11 different things, big data, cloud computing, the internet of things. If you're in tech, you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to zero in a little bit on some of them. So in the travel industry, for example, most important, data and the cloud, right? Having smart data, having good data, trying to figure out where it is and how to share it and how to be safe and secure, obvious, right? Language translation and human-machine interfaces, like the chatbot, right? I mean, if I'm going to change my flight, right, do I really have to talk to a person? I mean, I can talk to the chatbot. The chatbot knows how important I am to the company or not and it can get the job done. The chatbot can do 30,000 rebookings in 12 minutes, right? Not, not like a human. Do we need a human for this? Probably not. Right? Artificial intelligence is actually a very bad word, right? Because it's, yeah, all technology is artificial, right? Intelligent, no. Right? Um, it seems that there's intelligence in the system, but sometimes I think that technology as we use it today, is as dumb as a toaster. Right? Uh, because, for example, when you use Google Maps, it seems very intelligent, but we're, we're questioning it, right? Is this the right, really the right way? Are you sure? Right? It's not like a human. When you talk to a taxi driver in London, a good taxi driver, he has what's called the knowledge. Right? That's a lot more complex than the computer knowing the best way to go. It's a whole different thing. Right? So if I say to the computer, what is the best place to visit in Porto or in northern Portugal, I get all these options. I talk to a person, completely different. So I prefer to call it IA, Intelligent Assistance. That's really what it is. It's smart software. These machines are not intelligent like humans. We should not rely on them too much. We should question them. We should keep the humans in the loop. Don't think for a minute that if you use AI in the cloud, your business is safe. These are tools. We just use them as tools. Virtuality is going to be an amazing tool. Doctors, lawyers, uh, police, of course. Right? Consumers, I doubt it. I think a lot of people will want to use it. I've tried it. It's important. It's interesting. It will not replace real travel. I mean, today, look at this, for example, from an analog perspective. 
if you're using your latest iPhone, you're taking a picture of this, right? The iPhone captures an estimated two to three percent of what the human eye sees. And this is just a picture, right? When I see this, I hear things, I smell things, I feel things, you know, it's a thousand times as much. So to be in virtual reality, is that ever going to replace to go to a, I don't think so. I think it's a good simulation. Sometimes I say technology is like online dating. You know, I'm 61, I'm married, so I don't do much dating online. But if you use online dating, you can go and find the perfect match in the system. Right? Then you go to the date. 20 seconds, you realize, no. Right? And why is that? Because the system just uses what you type in. Right? And the reality is completely different. So it's useful but it's not a substitute. Here's, for example, a, uh, an AI called Dali, and I told it to put in the happy American tourist in Porto, of course, they're all happy, right, in Porto, with the river in the background uh, subject to an oil painting, right? And the AI made the picture. Now I asked the AI to put in an oil painting of angry locals protesting against Airbnb, right? And it made an oil painting. I think it's kind of interesting, it gives me some ideas. And that's an AI app called Lensa. I told it to make me look futuristic, you know. And so here I am in my space suit. You should give it a try, it's kind of an interesting tool. And then there's ChatGPT, which you may have heard about. It's a new chat engine by, by OpenAI. And here's a clip from the BBC, where you can, you can ask a live question, it's chat. Uh, chat.openai, but you can find it on the internet. You can ask it anything, and it will give you apparently an intelligent answer. Right? It's actually a kind of search that is currently working with typing, but it's also using images. It's pretty amazing stuff, right? But here is where it gets interesting. So I ask it to give me the future of tourism in Portugal. Right? It gave me an answer. That is kind of interesting, you know, you can ask it anything, it will give you an answer of a sort, right? So, but it wasn't really that exciting. It said the trend is growing in interest in digital nomads, remote work, and of course there's COVID, right? Kind of interesting, give me some ideas about what I'm going to talk to you about. But here's a guy on Skift who asked questions about what are the implications of generative AI, which is the chat thing, right, for marketing and the travel industry. And there it says some really interesting stuff, right? Creating personalized marketing materials, creating personalized recommendations, automating the creation of marketing content, really interesting stuff. But here's the thing, right? The reminder is algorithms know the logic of everything, but the feeling of nothing. And so therefore, let's use the algorithms for the logic, but let's not pretend that they know what it means to be human. We use it for things that are, you know, commodity work, right? You call it, you know, monkey work if you want, right? And all of us do monkey work, everybody does. Let's get rid of the monkey work. But the work that is human, we should keep, right? Because this is what makes us human. This is what makes tourism human, right? Experiences, creativity, imagination, empathy, consciousness. Right? That's a much different story. Machines don't understand any of this because they don't exist. A machine knows when I'm angry to look at my face and say, oh, Gerd is angry. Right? A machine will never know what it means to be angry. Right? Or maybe not never, let's say, you know, eventually somebody will figure that out too. Right? So we're going to live in a world like this where machines will do a lot of our routines. Like they do the routines in the factory already. They will do the routines in banking. They will do your online advertising, which they already are doing, right? Here's the most important thing about this. This is the future of our pyramid of work. That's why we're here, right? Because the lower part of this pyramid, like Maslow, a little bit, right? The lower part is machine territory. Logic, intellectual knowledge, data, information. Machines can do that. Not all of it, most of it. 
They can't do this part, which is our part, right? That's the human turf. Wisdom, understanding, purpose, quiet knowledge, deeper knowledge. And this is what we have to teach our kids. That's the jobs of the future. The only thing that will keep us separate from the machines is consciousness, right? The human only things. And this is why people will come to Portugal and to Porto and any other tourist destination, because they're going to feel something, right? Not because they're going to see a data download, right? Not because they're following a spreadsheet, right? When you fall in love with a person on a date, if it's a good date, right? It has nothing to do with the data. You didn't marry your husband or your wife because of efficiency, right? I mean, it's bad to have an inefficient partner, but, you know, the other thing is probably not entirely true, right? So, go back to the three revolutions. Really, what we see right now is business as usual is dead or dying. And that is good news. Because business as usual will kill us. We're not that far away, 20, 30 years, think about your kids, right? We continue the way we do with our consumption of unnecessary things, right? Our wrong priorities, our lack of collaboration, right? I mean, taking the dystopian view, it's quite clear. We're not gonna continue like we have. And so, right now, it's like 1968. I was seven years old in 1968, but if you were old enough, baby boomer generation. You know what happened from 1968 to 1973? The world changed. The war, the paradigm, the sexual revolution, the music revolution. Right? 2023 is like this. It's a year where everything changes. And I think we're looking to a very large catalyst of what that all means, bringing huge opportunities, but also a lot of confusion. So, a big part of what we have to learn is how do we deal with this? How do we go from a world that's based on this? Extraction. Right? And this is not just the oil and gas industry, it's tourism. Right? Extracting culture, extracting people, extracting nature, not giving back. And that will not work in the future. We're moving to a world of creation. Giving back. The circular economy creating new ideas, giving back to culture. And that means we're going to have to start paying what it actually costs. Right? Why do people fly from Manchester to Porto for three pounds and they stay overnight and then they fly net back next morning? Right? Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to some people, right? but that's called extraction. Right? I think we need to think about how we can create an industry that works on creation, on nature, positive impact. Look at these numbers from The Economist, right? Tourism is roaring back everywhere. Let's not make the mistake and go back to pre-COVID and say, now we're gonna build more hotels, we're gonna have more mass tourism, we're gonna have more Airbnb, we're gonna have more money, more jobs, more growth, more people, right? That will be a bad response. Let's build something new, build back better. Right? So very important for us to think in this direction. We have this paradigm shift. I don't have time to go through all of them. It will take all day. But when you download it later, you can look at those. We're in the age of paradigm shift. If you happen to be between 25 and 35, you are the pioneer of paradigm shift. And guess what? The Gen Y, the millennials, those are the people coming to Portugal, coming to go places in the future. Not people like me only, but the Gen Y. Because they're getting into all the money, from their parents, and the millennials will become the most important generation in the next five years. Those are the people you want. You want the other ones too, right? But we're talking about 55% of people. So I'll explain the paradigm shift a little bit on one of those examples. For example, here, we're going from the uh, challenge of economy, you know, making money, to the challenge of climate. It will be more important to stay alive than to make money. Can you imagine? <laughs> Just kidding. You stay alive, you make more money, that's great, but you're going to die because of climate change. That's a great result, right? Mission accomplished. The shift from carbon to clean, $150 trillion. Everything is shifting from pollution to regenerative. Right? And Portugal, I know, is a, is a pioneer in solar, for example. 
which is a very big uh, driving force here. From the boomer centric, you know, my age, which is about consumption. Huh? I come here because of the great, you know, uh, uh, port wine and, and, you know, looking at, at culture and the fish and, you know, okay, that's not necessarily bad. But when I do too much of it, it becomes bad, right? Now, millennials want to experience things. They want to be part of something. And they want something real. Right? They don't want to live inside of a Twitter bubble or Instagram feed. You know, if they even have Instagram still. Right? And work is going digital. Which means a lot of people will be working from somewhere in the mountains in northern Portugal, participating in the world economy. Right? That's already true. The last one is the biggest one. We're shifting from a policy based on profit and growth at all costs to people, planet, purpose, and prosperity, as I call it in my book. The, the quadruple bottom line, four things that matter. And in my view, not everybody should get paid and get their dividend or their bonus when they tick all four boxes, not just one. And you see this happening all around us already in this huge policy shift, and it's largely driven by women. You know, the countries that were run by women fared 40% better in the COVID times than the ones run by men. So you can say, of course, you know, this is quite clear. This is already an agenda that's forming around the world. And they have these guys, right? They are not women. Right? This is COP27. I think there is, let me see, yeah, there is one hiding here and one hiding here from the Bahamas. Why did we not get a great result at COP27? Maybe it wasn't enough women. Right. We're going to see a lot more of that in the future. That's part of the paradigm shift. In the car industry, we already have the paradigm shift towards a new kind of ideology. Right. It's no longer about having a car. It's about having transportation. Right. Multimodal transportation is shifting away from this idea of an ego system you know, owning your car, which is what we love to do, you know, if you're my age, to the ecosystem. And this is what we're doing here. We're building a new ecosystem. An ecosystem does not mean you can't have an ego, right? But you can't own the ecosystem, except for maybe Apple, you know. That's one of those examples. Uh, anyway, what we see here is that we're going from ego to eco, and that is travel and tourism is next on this agenda. Don't bet on ecosystem, you will lose everything unless you're a genius like Tim Cook or Steve Jobs, of course, was. So as an example, right, Airbnb situation in, in Barcelona or in Lisbon, right, that's been discussed many, many times. That's kind of an ecosystem approach, even though I would say that the answer to solve that is not easy. Right? There are many different layers here. Right? But it's time to include the externalities. If we're going to have Airbnb in places where I have a, a home in Lanzarote, Canary Islands, a lot of people who work in the hotels can't afford their own homes because there's people like me renting them. <laughs> there's something broken here that we have to think about. How do we solve this to be fair and not, be in, not stand in the way of innovation? Right? We don't want that either. So, this is the problem we have about sustainability, right? We are moving to a place where produce capital money for people like us, you know, we're the top 10%, roughly, right, is increasing. We made less money in COVID, but generally speaking, we're still doing pretty good. Human capital is kind of the same, but natural capital is declining. We go on like this, we're gonna have no more money and no planet, right? So what we have now is an emergency reboot. You're going to find emergency regulation on climate change and global warming popping up everywhere in the next couple of years. And you have to get ready for this. The only way that tourism will prosper is by putting this first, right? Putting the sustainability revolution first. For example, as we hear right now in the cruise terminal, right? Cruise ships. Is that actually a future fit? Is that possible to have cruise ships in the future based on the very business model of cruise ships? Can we apply the circular economy to cruise ships? That's going to be a tough mission, as the movie says. Maybe mission impossible. I don't know. But generally speaking, this is a big question. 
it cannot be about degrowth. I mean, my view is that if we go for degrowth, we can't have kids, we can't travel, we stay at home, we can't have fun, we can't drink, we can't smoke, whatever. It's all like basically not growing, right? This will not work because most people won't support it. <laughs> right. It has to be about circular, sustainable, equitable growth. This is the most important part. Participation of those that provide things. That brings me to airplanes. The future of airplane travel, right, this is not mission impossible, I don't think, but it is a tough one, right? And I'm super guilty. Yeah. Before COVID, I traveled 100 different trips, about 300 flights per year, okay? So I'm super guilty of the CO2 problem here. But you can clearly see, you know, of course, flying is the worst way to travel in terms of CO2, which is why there's no longer planes in France that go from Paris to Lyon because you can take the train, right? Look at the train, how much cheaper the train is compared to flying, right? So mind-boggling what's happening here basically is this, right? Again, it is the people who have the upper income, the high income, and the sort of medium income who do most of the traveling. The, the fact is that 10% of most uh, of, of travelers cause 90% of the pollution. That's, it, that's us, right, basically. What are we going to do about it? Here's a proposal. We're going to have a carbon tax that is based on frequent flyer. The more you fly, the more you pay. Right? This is a solution that has been uh, floated for quite some time. I think it's a great idea. So first time you fly is $20. When you fly 25 times, it's $200. When you fly 100 times, it's $2,000 because it would be fair, right? Not to burden the poor people who never travel anyway. Right? So interesting thing that's happening here. Mandatory and progressive tax on flights, paying what it costs, and shift to sustainable transportation. That's a huge challenge for airline travel. Right? And it's kind of a good sort of nutcase thing. So I want to talk about what the four Ps actually mean. This is the biggest shift, I think, in our society the shift away from the single-minded Milton Friedman objective, profit and growth, to four things. And I think the travel industry will be the first one to realize this. The more you can make your product based on those four things, the more successful you'll be. There are pockets where you can still just do people, you know, your, your profit-oriented thing, it will still work. But the millennials will not come if you don't do this. They'll ignore you. They'll hate you, actually. Do you know how many people are pulling out their money from public funds that support the oil industry? It's mind-boggling. There's a huge tidal shift going on, and we can see this happening everywhere. For example, in Norway, the government has said you cannot enter the fjord anymore unless you have a cruise ship that doesn't use a gas engine to come in. So they have to make a second engine, electric, to go into the fjord. I think it's a great idea. You know, force people to rethink. The Swiss Re insurance company says they're going to stop supporting giving insurance to coal plants, which makes it impossible to build a coal plant. Right? Universities have banned fossil fuel companies to come and promote to work for them as universities. These are big shifts going towards a new generation. That's starting right now. So tourism and travel. Sorry, a little more time here. My beautiful effect was destroyed here. So basically, I think tourism and travel is the canary in the coal mine for this shift. Because tourism and travel impacts everything. Employment, development, right? social life, everything. So that's going to be the new center there, and that's going to lead to all these new things, new paradigms, new narratives, new priorities, new rules. I'm very happy to see that here at this event, there's plastic bottles that, that can be used for the individual use. Right? That's just one step. Right? But if we did all of those things, right, it would add up to a very, very big step. So also what we're seeing here is a new human renaissance. Here's a joke from Noah Smith. It says, 15 years ago, the internet was an escape from the real world. Now the real world is an escape from the internet. That's just so true. 
and offline is the new luxury. I have a hotel I work with in Switzerland that you have to pay extra so you cannot get on the internet. That they will block the internet right, to keep your mind in there. Right? Keep in mind, uh, we're not like this, right? This is not what goes on inside the human brain. Right? This is a computer. We're not a data feed, we're not algorithms, we're not machines. We care mostly about this, right? Engagement, experiences, relationships. And that is, that is the ticket to the future of travel right? and tourism. That's what people want. And that also means we have to protect sometimes that very thing, which is called culture right? and our natural assets. So there's many ways to look at this and many different angles on this. And we have to get away from this thinking like what I call the Neoluvian man, that we are surrounded by technology, so everything can be solved with technology. No. It does take policy, right? It does take wisdom. <laughs> it does take coordination, uh, not just technology. So we're moving into a world where this is turning into this, what I call rewilding, right? This is what's important to us. Nature, other people, right? Rewilding, reconnecting. If you use this as your headline, you'll be successful. You know, reconnect with real people, reconnect with real places, and put it back. I'm a little bit out of time, so I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, I will skip the metaverse, even though, of course, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so what now? First, right, let's not think for a moment that the world is broken, that we don't have any options. Right? The future is much better than we think. We have all the tools we need. We have the tech, we have the quantum computing, we have nuclear fusion coming up. Right? We just have to make the right decisions and reprioritize. And this is basically on this paradigm that I showed you earlier, put your money there. Right? Digital, sustainable, green is the new digital, as I like to say. Going back to my film, right? let's get out of this uh, sort of dystopian view that the future is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Right? That is the future. Right? I mean, this is our reality. But let's not go inside and say, oh my God, you know, I, I can't do anything, I'm paralyzed, I'm uh, you know, just gonna go and have a couple of drinks. We need to switch the VUCA to this. Right? Not volatile, but basically velocity, unorthodoxy, inventing, right? co-creation, the good old American word, awesomeness. Right? I think Portugal is already awesome, but there's many, many things that we can do to make it better. That's what I call the future mindset. So to wrap up, some recommendations. Don't go into the future based on fear. This will destroy anything that you can possibly think of to innovate, right? Optimists make the future. Pessimists suffer the future. Very, very important. Get to the future before your customers. They're just waiting for you to show them how it works. Don't wait for the customer to say, I want plastic, no plastic bottles. They already do that, just haven't realized it yet. Right? Make that step. Move beyond extracting value. Create new values. Put your money back into old values. The digital revolution, of course, that's clear. The sustainable revolution, we have to go all in on this. I guarantee you in five years there will not be a single company in tourism that will not be on the circular sustainable economy. They won't exist. Whether they're big international companies or small local companies. Finally, the purpose of evolution, right? The purpose of things is what's important, not just the tech, how we get there, or the tool. So Buckminster Fuller, famous futurist, he said, we are to be architects of the future not its victims. And I wish for you to discuss that here and find the future of tourism for you. I want to thank you, Mucho Obrigado, for your time. Wait. <laughs> uh, put the slide back for a second. Sorry, I have one more thing I wanted to actually give you. Let's put the slide back for a second, please. You can download my book for free in Portuguese. It's called Technology vs. Humanity, the first hundred copies. So hurry up with the Amola phones. This is how you get there. Uh, and there's no marketing attached, no snooping, no spying, no profiling. Thank you.